Hello, and welcome to the Progressive Press. I'm Nicholas Garoff. Today I'll be speaking with John Perkins, activist and author. Perkins is a former corporate engineering consultant. He's best known for his 2004 memoir, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, as well as subsequent works, The Secret History of the American Empire and Hoodwinked. In his work as a self-described economic hitman, Perkins claims that on behalf of the National Security Agency and corporate affiliates, he worked to negotiate rigged bank loans with to developing nations, ultimately leading, ultimately leading many to ruin and what he describes as economic colonialism. Since leaving the field, Perkins has become an international icon in the fight to expose and address what he describes as the growing corporatocracy at work, as well as in his efforts to aid in the preservation and awareness of indigenous peoples and vulnerable populations throughout the globe. Joining me now, John Perkins. Mr. Perkins, it's a pleasure to have you. Hi, Nicholas. Good to be with you. You can call me John, oh, please. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to jump right into it. Now, just for those who may not be familiar with your works um, or your, your novels, uh, could you describe just a bit as to what exactly an economic hitman is? I think it's fair to say that economic hitmen have produced the world's first truly global empire. Uh, and it's an empire that's not run by governments. It's run by big corporations for the first time in history. It hasn't been uh, created through the military for the most part. It's been created through economics. And economic hitmen who do this work in many different ways, but perhaps the most common is that we will identify a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then uh, create a, a huge loan for that uh, for that country from the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, USAID, or one of their sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to develop infrastructure projects for that country, things like power plants and industrial parks that help a few very wealthy families, as well as our own corporations, who are the major beneficiaries, but don't help the majority of the people. They're too poor to buy electricity. They can't get jobs in industrial parks because industrial parks don't hire many people. And yet they're left holding a huge debt that they can't repay. So at some point we go back and say, since you can't pay your debts, uh, sell your oil or whatever the resource is real cheap to our companies without any environmental restrictions or any social regulations or vote with us on the next major United Nations vote, allow us to build a military base on your soil things like that, that are really creating an empire. And in the cases where we fail, where the economic hitmen are not able to corrupt leaders to accepting these loans, uh, then we send, then the jackals are sent in. And these are people who either overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. I talk in my books, Nicholas, about how I failed with Jaime Roldos, the president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama. As a result, they were both assassinated. And in the few cases where the Jackals also fail, such as with Saddam Hussein in Iraq, then the military goes in as a last resort. I see. So um, now just to clarify, when you say, uh, when, you, when you use the word jackals, you're speaking of intelligence, oper uh, intelligence operatives? Yeah, these are, for the most part these days, private contractors. You know, the, the, the old days of the 007, the government agent licensed to kill, are, are, are pretty much gone. Um, the government doesn't want to directly take part in these things, so they hire private contractors, usually people who've been trained by the CIA or the Special Forces or the SEALs or some such organization. And so you're referring, you're referring here then to, to organizations such as um, Z, formerly known as Blackwater, or uh, perhaps um, Titan, uh, Titan Consultancy? Yeah, those are, the, those are the best known ones, and probably in some respects the, 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 the least sophisticated uh, but yes, these are private corporations uh, you know, that, that do this as private corporations and private individuals within those corporations, a few that are very specialized. I see. Now, um, now just uh, when, when did you begin this work as an economic hitman? 1970, 71, and it's really 1970. I, I was, I'd been in the Peace Corps. I got out of the Peace Corps. Let's see, it was actually 71 that I began the work and did it for just 10 years until 81. See, and, and, and how was it you got involved with this? Well, bef while I was still a, a student at, at Boston University, uh, just down the road from where you are in New Hampshire, uh, I was in business school there, and uh, I, the draft was hounding me. It was the time of the Vietnam War, 
Uh, and so I was married at the time. My wife's father was very high up in the Department of the Navy. One of his best friends was very high up in the National Security Agency. Uh, working for the National Security Agency was draft deferrable. It did not automatic, but it was up to your draft board. It was likely to get draft deferred. So he arranged for me to have an interview with them, and I went through a series of tests in Boston at the JFK building there, uh, including lie detector tests, personality tests, and was offered a job in the National Security Agency. Uh, but then I, I heard a Peace Corps recruiter speaking at uh, Boston University, and I was very interested. I'd always wanted to live in the Amazon. I, as, a, as a kid growing up in rural New Hampshire, I have some Abnaki blood. My, my, my relatives go back over 300 years in New Hampshire and Vermont. And uh, I'd always been interested in, in Indian lore. And so I knew that one of the few places in the world where that still exists in its traditional sense is the Amazon. So I, I asked about joining the Peace Corps, and I talked to this man who'd recruited me at the National Security Agency. And he said, my goodness, that would be a really good thing. That would be good training for you. We'll, you know, we won't stop you. In fact, we may help you get in and get to the Amazon. You'll learn another language. You'll learn survival techniques. I'm, I'm and, pretty and yeah, just uh, to clarify, now this man with the National Security Agency, um, are you referring to to Einar Grieve, um, the individual you you um, speak about? No, no, I'm, I'm referring. I'm I'm speaking of a guy I refer to in the book as as Uncle ah. Frank. That's what my 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 wife called him. He was very close to the family, and uh, then uh, so he 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 encouraged me to go into the Peace Corps. Once I was there in my my last year, Einar Grieve, who was a senior vice president at Charles T. Maine, a consulting firm in Boston, which has since been bought out and the, the name no longer exists. But Einar Grieve then was, came to Ecuador and essentially recruited me to join Charles T. Maine. And as it turned out, Einar was a, 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 a high up officer in the Army Reserve who liaisoned with the NSA and the other intelligence agencies. So. There was a there was a long track there, and it's a little murky, but it all ties together as far as I'm concerned. I see. Uh, now, once you'd um, now and now after your time in the Peace Corps, when you um, when you were recruited in by uh, Mr. Grieve, correct? You were uh, recruited into the with the uh, consulting firm, correct? Right. Um, upon, upon there, what was your uh, wh where was your first assignment? Where was the first place you were sent to? Indonesia, and I went through a training period in Boston with this woman named Claudine, Claudine Martin, or Claudine Martin was actually her Spanish name. And uh, she she kind of clued me in on what I was really supposed to do. My official title was economist. I very quickly became chief economist after, after, not, after a couple of assignments. But I was officially an economist. Uh, economic hitman was a term that she used kind of tongue in cheek, the same way you might refer to CIA officers as spooks or spies. <coughs> Excuse me. They certainly don't call themselves that in public, mm -hmm. but that's how we think of them, and they often think of themselves. Yeah, sure. So economic economic hitman was this tongue in cheek term. I was an economist. She gave me an, uh, some training, uh, and then uh, I was sent off to Indonesia for three months. Now, now prior to um, your involvement, uh, how, how long had had these economic hitmen? Um, it worked, uh, you know, throughout the globe. I mean, I guess, I guess the question here is, how new or how old is this particular practice? It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating history in, in a way, uh, um, Nicholas. I, I think, in some respects, you know, you could date it back a very long time ago. But, but the fact of the matter is that empires were usually built by militaries, and for the most part, the people in the countries building the empires approved of it. So there was the Spanish Empire, which was built under the under the auspices that they were going into around the world. They're going into Latin America, for example, to convert heathen, to bring them around to Catholicism so they could go to heaven. And most Spanish people really believe that that was the right thing to do. As far as we know, they believe that. Uh, other empires were built on spreading civilization. The British Empire, for example, was very keen on spreading British civilization to India and Africa and other places. Uh, and the military went in. It was done through the military for the most part. But in 19, in the early 1950s, uh, a, a premier was democratically elected in Iran. His name was Mossadegh. And uh, he ran on a ticket that said that he would force the oil companies there, foreign oil companies, to pay a greater share of their profits to the Iranian people for the oil they took out of Iran. 
um, when he became premier, he started to implement this. And he, was, he threatened to, to, to chase out the international oil companies, particularly a British company, which today is known as BP. Um, the British and we in the United States became very incensed about this. We weren't going to let uh, the, the, this Mossadegh, uh, it was, you know, this, what we called a despot in Iran. He was not a despot. He was uh, democratically elected, very popular prime minister. We were not going to let him hold us up for ransom. But Eisenhower, who was president at the time, was reluctant to send in troops, which would be the traditional approach, because Iran bordered Russia, the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons, and so did we. And the Cold War had just begun. So Eisenhower was very nervous about creating a nuclear war. Uh, and he and his secretary of state and head of the CIA, the two Dulles brothers, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, they, they kind of arrived at this unique approach uh, they sent a CIA agent named Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's grandson. You're speaking of Operation into, Ajax, I believe it's called, yes? Yeah, into Iran with a few million dollars. And uh, Roosevelt was extremely successful at paying people off, hiring people to demonstrate against Mossadegh, made it look as though he was unpopular. This was shown across the world, and especially in the United States, by our television and, and our press. And in the end, uh, he managed to overthrow uh, Mossadegh in, in a CIA coup and replace him with the Shah of Iran, who we all know became a big friend of oil, big friend of the United States, big friend of all of our corporations. Except not the Iranian but, people, of course. So, yes. so would you put? So would you then perhaps point to um, the, that point in history, uh, Operation Ajax, and and Kermit Roosevelt's involvement in uh, in Iran as perhaps the sort of the birth of the modern economic hitman then? There's no question about it. What this showed was that without much risk and very inexpensively, we could take over a country in essence. We, we took over Iran because the Shah was our puppet. And, um, and, and there'd been very little risk of war. Uh, people, most people around the world didn't realize what we had done. The one problem was that, that Roosevelt was a card-carrying CIA agent. He truly was a sort of an 007 who, who not only could bribe people, but he had a license to kill, theoretically anyway. And um, if he'd been caught, it would have been very embarrassing for the State Department and the U.S. government. So very quickly after that, the decision was made to use a private contractors. So a whole new system was set up that, where you buy a hard consulting firms like mine to essentially do what Roosevelt had done, although we very quickly learned that it was even more effective not to organize um, protests and strikes and, and so on. That would, that would be a last resort, but rather to go in and essentially bribe officials, a combination of bribing uh, local officials and also threatening them with if they didn't accept the bribes, if they didn't play the game, then they would be overthrown or assassinated. So a, a stick and carrot, um, plausible deniability situation then. Absolutely. And it was all done, uh, for the most part, with uh, by private contractors funded by U.S. agencies or organizations like the World Bank that, that really serve U.S. agencies. Now, this, now this history regarding, uh, regarding your former profession and regarding the, the act of, as you put it, economic colonialism. Um, now, was this part, of, did, did you learn this as part of your training um, during, during the intake to, to becoming an economic hitman, or was this something you learned after the fact? Well, it's a combination, really, Nicholas, because in, even in business school, what we learned, and it's still taught in business school, is that if you want to help a country develop, a, a third world country, let's call it, a country like Iran was back then, um, you should infuse a tremendous amount of money into infrastructure, build up the electrical system, build up the highway system and the port system and industrial parks, et cetera. And, and, and when you do that, the economy will grow. And in fact, statistically, we can show that that's true. So using econometric models, we see that that does happen. So I'd learned this in business school. But what we don't see, what the models didn't show, is that in most cases, only a very few people in that country benefit, the very wealthy. The majority of the people, whether we're talking about Iran or Ecuador or Panama or Nigeria, the majority of the people aren't really part of the economic system a lot of their activities and never make it to the statistics. They, people trade things, uh, barter. They shop in local markets where nothing's recorded. 
And, and in any case, the very wealthy uh, control 99% of the economy. Is, that's actually so, very common. So what, that's a, it's a common line we hear now, actually, about the 99%. It, 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 yes, it's become increasingly true here also and in Europe. But back then it was very true. So, I, you know, while at the beginning I could really see this as the right approach, what I was doing, um, as time went on, I could actually I could see that, that what we were doing was, was, was a fabrication, that we were not helping the poor at all. In fact, the poor were getting poorer. The gap between rich and poor was getting wider. And I think I was able to see that, whereas others in my position might not have because I'd been in the Peace Corps, because I'd been downriver of hydroelectric plants. I'd seen that the indigenous people who live below the dams suffer tremendously. So upriver... You've got water that's now being used by farmers, the wealthy farmers upriver. More than anything, you're producing tremendous amounts of electricity that are helping those who own the industries and the banks and the commercial centers. But downriver, the indigenous people, the farmers downriver, they're losing their water, they're losing their fish, they're losing everything, and they're, and they're not getting any electricity. And furthermore, in a, in a struggle to pay off the loans, to pay the interest on the loans, the country diverts money from education healthcare and other social services toward paying off its debt. And it's never ultimately never able to pay off its debt. So it becomes a servant and has to get, reach other con uh, conditions. Servant too, as you, as you put it, the, the corporatocracy. Now, now just to, to expand on the corporatocracy a bit, um, now could you just, just briefly explain sort of what you mean when you use that term? You know, I think Eisenhower in his, in his closing speech, his last speech as president, uh, warned us against an industrial military complex. Uh, what he left out of that, in a way, was the, the banking, the financial sector, and the commercial sector. But you know, it, it's it really kind of, it's happened. But I think corporatocracy today is a better term because really all of this is run by the big corporations today. So it, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I was just actually going to to just to uh, to ask because a common a common argument you hear now when it comes to our uh, discussions of corporate malfeasance and. Uh, you know, the haves and the have-nots and such, uh, often comes down to a very polarized argument or conversation about who's to blame, be it government or corporations. Would you say then that corporatocracy as a term and a concept marries the two? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, mar it marries it, and yet it's an unfair marriage because really the government works for the corporations today. So maybe a couple of hundred years ago, we could say that the global politics of the world was run by religious organizations, and then it became governments. But now it's moved beyond governments to big corporations. And, you know, at the top of these corporations, the people I call the corporatocracy, the actual individuals who are roughly the equivalent of the old emperor, this isn't a conspiracy theory, incidentally. These people don't have to get together to conspire to do anything illegal. But those people sitting at the top will run the biggest corporations, and then they or their underlings, their senior vice presidents, become secretary of state. And they, they, they become president sometimes. <laughs> so there's this revolving door uh, so that the individuals at, who run our government usually are part of the big corporations, too. They come out of the corporations, and after they serve their term in government, they go back to the corporations. It's not unusual for the agency that watchdogs oil companies, for example, to have at its head a former executive in the oil industry who knows he's going to go back to the oil industry once he leaves government. That's a tremendous conflict of interest, but totally legal in our country. And so you've got this, the, the, the person like that is obviously going to protect his interest as an oil executive while he's, while he's supposedly watchdogging oil so companies. So talking about so, in, um, industrial appointments to regulatory offices, um, which, I, I mean, this may be conjecture, but I would imagine are largely... Um, if not pre, you know, prearranged, are perhaps bought and paid for by campaign contributions and the like? Well, yes. There's no question that all of our politicians in high offices are owned by corporations. And it's not their fault. O Obama is beholden to big corporations. He, he, he wouldn't be president if he weren't. It's, it's really not his fault. He, could, he, he couldn't get to where he is if he didn't accept a lot of money from corporations. And even if he could, let's say somebody comes along, let's say a Ron Paul comes along and actually sticks to his guns and says, I'm not going to take any money from corporations, becomes president, 
extremely unlikely. In fact, I would I would venture to say impossible. But let's just assume it happened. He still got to deal with a Congress that's beholden to big corporations and with over 10,000 corporate lobbyists in Washington, D.C. alone. So the, the government is very, very strongly influenced by corporations. That president would also have to deal with the mainstream media that's owned by the big corporations, mm -hmm. either outright ownership or through advertising budgets. The so these corporations truly call the, the shots. The deck is, is really stacked against... against and I think, I think, do it. yeah, I think, Nicholas, one other important point here is if you did get a president in office like that, he, like every other president, would very quickly realize that he's extremely vulnerable. That, you know, in Kennedy's day, you had to bring a president down with a bullet. But today, you don't. Rumor, innuendo, you know, a sex scandal that may or may not be true, uh, a, a, a drug scandal can destroy a president. And Obama is certainly very aware of this. You know, all the the silly gossip and, and, and accusations about whether he's an American citizen, whether he's Muslim, whether he was born in Indonesia, or, or whether heck, ever the last place, <laughs> whether Kenya, you know. I mean, all of that is just shots across the bow to let the guy know, hey, you know, if you don't toe the line, we can get you, we can take you down, in the same way that Clinton was brought down, in the same way that, uh, that, you know, a number of other people have been brought down. I mean, all, all it takes is a sex scandal. It, it, it may be true or it may not be or true. Or in the case of modern days, it doesn't even take a sex scandal. It just takes a rumor or such. Um, if, if I could ask, uh, just presently, who would you say the, um, the largest players, both individually and institutionally, are in terms of the, maintaining this, this corporatocracy and this system that we have? Well, you know, the oil companies, to start, to start with, have incredible power. I think we cannot estimate their power because they themselves don't even have to do very much. They realize and that, that the pharmaceutical industry depends upon them. Uh, the, the, the electric utility industry depends upon them. The transportation industry depends upon them. The wholesale industry, you know, the grocery industry depends on them for all that's packaging. Insurance companies, banks, uh, healthcare systems, so oil is extremely powerful, and we see that today in, in you know, the, the, the difficulty of getting laws that really put the right price on, on fossil fuels as compared to solar, to, you know, the costs are constantly externalized for oil, you know, where it, so truly solar, if we, if we factored all the true costs and including the social costs, oil would be phenomenally expensive, much more expensive than solar or wind or, or other alternatives. But these companies have tremendous power. You know, beyond that, a lot of other organizations ha have power. In any, or any company that's in the top 100, Fortune, Fortune 100 or Fortune 500, exercises a, a great deal of power. And, I, and that's not to suggest that all the CEOs are, are corrupt or are out to, to screw us. I, I don't think they are at all. I, I've known a lot of top managers in very big corporations. And I have to say that personally, I haven't met any that, that want to see Florida sink beneath the ocean. Or I, haven't, I don't know any personally that are sociopaths or psychopaths, as far as I know. I know, I know some are. I'm sure the people at Enron were. But the fact of the matter is, they are operating under a, a goal that says the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. And they see as their job exactly to do that. And we, the consumer, constantly send them messages. We say things like, hey, you know, I want a cheap shirt that's high quality. If that means it has to be made by slaves in sweatshops in Indonesia, I'll just look the other way. I want cheap petroleum. Don't, don't raise the price of gasoline in this country. And if that means destroying the Amazon, I'll just look the other way. We've sent them this the question message. question of self-interest versus, versus common interest, then. Well, I think we play into their hands. And I think it's it, it, we, the consumer, we, the people, have to understand that the power ultimately is with us. We can't look to Obama to do it. We can't look to McCain to do it. We can't look to Ron Paul to do it. We have to look to us to do it. And we have a tremendous amount of power if we un only understand that, that, that the marketplace, what supports these big corporations, is a democracy.
that every time we buy something or choose not to, we're casting a vote. And it's probably a much more important vote than the one we cast every four years for president or every two years, because we're casting it every every day or every week or very frequently. And we're casting it with it at the real power base. The real power base is the corporations. It is not the politicians. Um, now, uh, just uh, sort of to expand on that just a little bit, um, another, another author I'm a personal fan of who's actually widely prolific, uh, Christopher Hedges, and I'm sure you're familiar with him, uh, wrote extensively in his book, Death of the Liberal Class, about efforts that were made um, during the 20th century, early parts of the 20th century and throughout the 20th century to control the narratives and dialogues that go on politically and socially, you know, whittling it down to two parties, and just as you've said, both of whom are now beholden to corporations. In recent years, um, the, the conservative side of that sentiment seems to have really further embraced the, the self-interest, every man is an island sort of mentality. Do you think in any way that that may be a part of the strategy in order to keep people accepting, for instance, like you say, cheap clothing made in sweatshops while they put their blinders on? Yes, I, I have no doubt about it. And I also think that the tension that we see in Congress constantly, that deadlocks Congress all the time, is a strategy. Uh, you know, the, the big corporations support both the Democrats and the Republicans. And they send messages to each side, you know, don't accept that from the other side. And, you know, it's, it's the old divide and conquer. If you, you know, if you, if you wanted to defeat the, the Lakota or the Cheyenne or, or whoever in this country, you, you tried to divide them and conquer them, split them up, give some of them great gifts and have them go against their brothers. We, we've done that, you know, the colonial powers did the same thing in Latin America and Africa. And we're doing it here now uh, to our own people, to the consumer. And, and, and in our Congress, you know, keep them divided, keep them fighting with each other, have two parties that are, that are constantly warring with each other o o over fairly minor issues, really. Uh, but, but keep it divided. And that way, you know, we get our way. That's, that's what the corporatocracy is thinking and saying. So, yeah, and, you know, it's, it's kind of shocking how you, it, all of the, most of the uh, polls will, will show you that, that, that people sympathize on many, many issues, primarily with the Democrats. And yet, the Republicans continue to hold power, even on issues where it appears that the majority of the people would disagree uh, with the Republicans. But they continue to hold the power. And they, um, they really represent the, the, the big moneyed interest to, to a large degree. I say this having come from a family that was very staunchly Republican. And I'm not holding anything against individuals who are in the Republican Party. I, it just strikes me as very, very interesting that, that we have a country today that essentially, from a poll standpoint, from a consensus standpoint, disagrees with a lot of the, the policies that the Republicans promote and yet continues to some degree to vote Republican. And the Republicans are in a position to filibuster, to, to stop progress in a very real sense. And the Democrats are constantly shooting themselves in the foot and, and trying to act, you know, trying to rationalize issues that aren't that, that people don't care about the rationalizations behind them. People are much more struck by the emotional sides. of Rhetorical issues. politicking, um, classical Edwin Bernays style things. Um, no, understood. Now, now, moving on. Now, once you've come to recognize all of this, just getting back to while you were working and, and, and your time in the Peace Corps having given you a certain insight that allowed you to recognize what you were doing as uh, as destructive or, or wrong. Um, when did you first, I mean, was there, was there a specific moment you can remember when you realized what you were doing d didn't sit well with you, didn't feel right? There were a number of moments that led up to it. Uh, yes, uh, it's throughout those 10 years that I was it, an economic hit man. Um, things kept happening that would make me question what was going on. And I would say about halfway through those 10 years, I really began to question what was happening. But I must admit, uh, my own fallacy was that I grew up in rural New Hampshire, and my dad was a prep school teacher at a boys' private school in New Hampshire. Uh, he never made money. Basically, he, he got a very, very tiny salary, but our, our house was provided by the school. I ate in the dining room with 200-some-odd boys for uh, since the time I was about six years old. 
And so we had plenty of food, we had a house, we had everything we needed, very little money. I was surrounded by boys with a tremendous amount of wealth who came from Caracas and Paris and New York and Boston, you know, wealthy, wealthy families. And then I ended up going to that school for high, for high school, of course. And these my classmates would go home for vacation at Christmas. They'd come back with stories of amazing orgies and debutante balls and all these kinds of things. And I'd spent my Christmas vacation shooting baskets by myself in the school gymnasium because I had a key. And I was determined at that point in my life that I would do what they were doing that I would travel first class, I would see the world, I would go to Indonesia, I would go to South America, I would go to Europe, I blah, 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 blah. So once I began, now I'm an economic hitman, mm. and I'm doing all this, you know, I've got an amazing expense Number account. Five. that I, Yeah, all that, you know, and so once I began to see the truth behind this, I have to admit, I didn't want to see the truth. I was living a great life in, in, on the, on the, ostensibly. On the other hand, my conscience was bothering me terribly. I was, I was consuming tremendous amounts of alcohol, Valium. I was not really happy, but I thought I was happy. I had the trappings that I'd always wanted all my life. I was realizing what I thought had been my dream. So it took me a while to really understand what was, what was going on. And it wasn't until uh, I'd been in for almost 10 years that I was on vacation in the Virgin Islands. I had a, I'd rented a small sailboat that I was sailing with a, with a woman friend there. And uh, I rode ashore late one afternoon and hiked up this hill to an old sugarcane plantation in ruins, sat there with a, a couple of beers, look, looked by myself, looking out at the sun setting over the Caribbean, surrounded by Bougainvillea. It was idyllic, it was beautiful, and suddenly I was struck by the fact that this plantation had been built on the bones of thousands of slaves. And then as I sat there, I realized the whole hemisphere is built on the bones of millions of slaves. And then I had to admit that I too was a slaver, a modern version of slavery. And, and at that point, a lot of things had led up to it, but it was at that point that I decided I could no longer live with myself if I did this anymore. And I committed to going back and quitting which I and did. did you have any? Um, did you encounter any sort of problems in extracting yourself from that life? Because clearly, with you know, clearly with what you'd been doing, you were privy to sensitive information and such. And I imagine there must have been um, some level of pressure for you, at least, either to remain where you were or to remain silent. Did you did you encounter any sort of issues like that while you? Huge, huge, huge. The president of Charles C. Main, the company I worked for, put tremendous pressure on me to stay. I had a department of uh, several dozen people working for me at the time, and they all, they, 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 you know, they, they had to believe I was, either, I was crazy, because if I wasn't crazy to leave my incredible job, then they had to be crazy to stay. But the company put tremendous pressure on me, there's no question. Uh, and in fact, I did get rehired at one point to, to do consulting work for them. They, they tried everything they could think of. But then I started writing uh, the book uh, that ultimately became Confessions in the early 80s. And I, I reached out to interview other people I knew in the business, economic hitmen, jackals, to get them into the book. And I received anonymous phone calls, threats on my life and on my daughter's life, who was born in 1982. Serious threats that I took very seriously because I had seen what had happened. Omar Torrijos had been assassinated and I loved Omar. He was a very good friend. And uh, president of Panama, or head of state of Panama, and Jaime Roldos, president of Ecuador, whom I knew personally. So I took the threat seriously. At about the same time, the chairman of the board of Stone and Webster, a big Boston-based engineering consulting firm, took me out to dinner and said, hey, you know, you got a great resume. I did. I'd been chief economist at one of his rival companies. He said, we'd like to use your resume in some of our proposals. Uh, you won't have to do any work for us, really. Just let us use your resume, and we'll, we'd like to pay you a consultant's retainer of $500,000. This is in the mid-'80s, late-'80s. $500,000 was worth a lot more then than it is now. Just don't write that book we know you're working on. So my life is being threatened. My daughter's life is being threatened. I am being offered a bribe, a totally legal bribe, and I took it. And in, in, in good conscience, I'll have to say, I didn't go out and buy a fancy car or a big new house or something. I, I put it toward creating nonprofits, toward writing other books about indigenous people. I wrote five books, Shape Shifting, The World is As You Dream It, Psychonavigation, Spirit of the Books like that about indigenous people, which they were fine with. 
And I put a lot of my money into creating nonprofits like Dream Change, you know, ultimately the Pachamama Alliance, which are still in existence. But I didn't write the book. And then on 9-11, I was in the Amazon with a group of people that are taken in to learn from Amazonian people there about uh, sustainability. And when I came home, I flew up to ground zero. And as I stood there, I knew I finally had to write this book. That, I, that, that the world had to know what I had done and what others like me did. But at this point, I decided I wouldn't tell a soul I was writing the book, not even my wife and daughter, until I had it totally written and the manuscript completely finished and in the hands of a very good New York agent who sent it out to publishers. And at that point, it became my best insurance policy. And in a way, it still is, Nicholas. So you, you, know, so you in many ways, actually had the same sort of stick and carrot um, offered and threatened to you as you had extend, you and your employers had extended to previous countries. Um, That's true. There has been, obviously, as, as with any, you know, any, any high-profile individuals or, or, or issues, and especially when they, uh, anyone tries to bring serious issues to uh, the front, to attention, um, there's obvious criticism. Uh, Sebastian Malaby of the Washington Post um, reacted very strongly to your book, uh, saying it was nonsense and all of this. And um, oddly enough, uh, in to, to in an attempt to counter your your points uh, about loan dispersals and such, he actually pointed to Indonesia, uh, citing that birth rates and uh, infant mortality had improved. Uh, the, the rates of, of birth rates and infant mortality in, in the area had improved. Um, what do you think, if any, I mean, first off, what do you believe maybe his motivation to reacting like that was? Do you think it was just to get, grab headlines, or is he beholden himself to certain players, or what could that be? Well, I don't like to cast aspersions on people I don't know and don't know their background, but let's face it, the Washington Post, the New York Times, these are all uh, owned, essentially financed by big corporations. Uh, they don't like what I said. Uh, the State Department published a, 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 a special misinformation website that only had my book on it for the longest time. And they tried was, claiming, actually, they well, they claimed that the, uh, the State Department uh, made a statement saying that the National Security Administration is a cryptological organization and not in the business of international finance. So. Right. Well, well, and we all know that the NSA does a lot more than cryptography. We know that they tap our telephones. We know that they own the Pueblo, the ship that was that was taken down. We we know that they have spies out in the field. We know this. So, you know, it it it's it's a, it's a, it's a lie, first of all, and and second of all, I, I'd have to say that that website sold a lot of books for me. So I I was actually <laughs> very pleased with it, and I and I'm I'm pretty sure I know why it happened because a, a major television show in, in, in Athens, Greece, um, came to visit me at, I have a, still have a home in New Hampshire, uh, and spent a couple of, it's been a day with me and uh, three different summers in a row. And after the first interview, when they, the, the head guy came back and very, very well-known broadcaster in, in, in Greece, he said that after the first show, the, U, the US ambassador called him into his office and, and chewed him out. And and the reason was that the ambassador said it was extremely embarrassing to even have my book mentioned because he after the show, he said he got a lot of calls from Greece, Greeks and also U.S. businessmen in Athens asking what his position was on the book. Is it true? And the ambassador said, I don't know what to say. They asked, so what's the State Department's official position? The ambassador said, I don't know. He said it was extremely embarrassing. And so this 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 fellow from the uh, Greek uh, TV station said, you know, I'm sure that that ambassador, and I'm sure it happened in other countries, went back to State Department and demanded an official position. So State Department published this uh, website so that there are ambassadors around the world and, and, and other people could, when asked, could say, well, here, go to this website. That's our official position. Other than that, I have no comment. I haven't read the book or whatever. So it was very interesting how that happened. I, I will say that the New York Times ran a major article, the whole half page above the fold of the front page of the of the Sunday financial se section where they very deeply vetted the book. Uh, one of their reporters spent a lot of time with me, went deep into w what I said, you know, contacted my old college, Middlebury College, contacted many other people and came to the conclusion that the book was uh, true. 
Uh, so it's been very strongly vetted, uh, despite what what the guy at the post says and others. And I don't know what their motivations were. But perhaps just to grab headlines. And and when you mentioned Greece, uh, oddly enough, as it happens now, Greece is drowning in debt um, from foreign <laughs> banks. So um, it, it's it's a rather interesting uh, turn of events there. Now. Now, yes. uh, now you're um, heavily involved with the uh, the, pot, uh, the Pachamama. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Pachamama uh, yes. Alliance. It's actually uh, how we were able to uh, get in touch with you. The Progressive Press was able to get in touch with you. Um, in addition to that, um, what 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 other efforts are you are you under are undertaking right now to try and you know expose and address the you know the the corporatocracy and these economic hitmen? Well. You know, I'm on the so I'm a founder and on the board of Pachamama Alliance. I'm very active in Pachamama Alliance, and uh, a new the, the the president of Ecuador, who 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 we worked with very strongly, Rafael Correa, was just reelected two days ago for his second term, and he's been a fairly strong advocate of environmental issues. He supported Ecuador being the first country in the in the world to have a new constitution that gives inalienable rights to nature. Mm-hmm. And we were deeply involved in that, so I take great pride in that. Also, an organization called Dream Change that we work with corporations. We're working with permaculture groups. We're working with the University of Massachusetts and others to help uh, help corporations become more responsible. Uh, and uh, Clear Path International. I'm on their board. It's an organization that works with landmine victims in in Iraq and Afghanistan and in. Laos, Cambodia, places like that. But more than anything else, Nicholas, what I see my job is is to write, to speak out. So I do a lot of traveling. This last year I was in Istanbul and Iceland and Latin America and like China recently and many, many other places. And soon I'm headed to Canada and Istanbul again and Italy, um, speaking out on these issues. I think each one of us has to follow our own passions and use whatever our particular skills are. And if we all head down to the same, toward the same destination of creating a sustainable, just, peaceful world, a world that our grandchildren will want to inherit, then we'll get there. And we all have to do it in different ways. You know, you have your way. You've got this, this program that you're developing and running, and it's, it's very important. I see myself primarily as a writer and also as someone then to follow up by doing what we're doing here right now. Um, I, you know, I'm 67 years old. I'm, I, I used to go on the front line sometimes during the Vietnam War and other places. And I think there's a lot of people that should be doing that. And I'd be willing to do it, too. But I don't want to uh, dissipate my, my efforts too much. I want to keep writing. I want to keep speaking out. I want to keep traveling. No camping at so, um, Occupy Wall Street or anything of that nature, then. Eh? So no camping me? out at uh, any Occupy Wall Street. Well, I, 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 yeah, well, I did San Francisco and, and Oakland uh, for a bit. Uh, I think I was very, very supportive of the Occupy movement. I think it was an important and still is an important movement. So I'm very supportive and of you it. Feel yes. the, uh, do you feel the evolution of Occupy? I mean, I, I myself and I know a number of individuals who uh, have been heavily involved and, and it has in many ways evolved into, into a, a new breed of activism. Um, would, yes. would, you, would you speak, though, to, I mean, because conventional activism and for the longest time, uh, especially in America, there was a great deal of talk about apathy, just just dragging everyone down and being the reason nothing gets done. Um, would, would you draw any kind of comparisons between uh, between the Occupy movement here and perhaps the, the Arab Spring or any of the other uh, any of the other populist uprisings in, in relation to a corporatocracy? Yeah, I think all of these are extremely important, and I think they're all showing us that we are waking up. People around the world are getting it, whether it's the Arab Spring, whether it's what's going on in Russia and demonstrations against Putin. It's happening in China. It's happening big time in Latin America, where 10 countries recently have, in democratic elections, voted in presidents that are standing up to what used to be the the brutal dictators in all of those countries. Uh, we're seeing tremendous uh, w- awakening across this planet, I believe. And, and, and I'm very, very hopeful uh, that people are getting it and we're moving forward. I also think people within corporations themselves are beginning to wake up. We've got a lot of work to do. It's an exciting time. We are in, in revolutionary times. There's no question. And, you know, for the first time in human history, we're, we're, we have the capability of communicating with every single human being on the planet. 
Five years ago, I, I couldn't talk with anybody deep in the Amazon, the indigenous people I work with there. But now they have cellular satellite cell phones. And so do people high up in the Himalayas, people that used to believe they'd never have telephones because the telephone wires could never reach them. Today, they don't need telephone wires. You know, we're talking with people across the planet through, through Skyping like this, through uh, streaming, through texting. It's amazing. We're, we're at a tremendously revolutionary time in history, and I think it's terribly important that we recognize this. And I take great hope in people of your generation. As I travel around at colleges speaking, I've seen a huge change in the last seven or eight years. Back, uh, back in 2005, 2006, when Confessions first came out, people, particularly students at MBA programs, would tell me that their whole interest in life was gaining more power and money. But today I hear something very different for the most part. I hear that they want to have children and they want to create a world that their children will be proud to grow up in. I'm really seeing tremendous change. And, I, you know, it's not across the board. There are exceptions. But, but there's a change in attitude and atmosphere. The fact you're doing this program is extremely encouraging. And you're not alone. And you know that. There's a lot of people out there doing it. And you're all working together, you know. You don't, I don't think you probably feel competitive with the other people. You feel like you're... You know, you're part of a team. You're part of a, a coalition. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's part the, of the democratization of information. And yes, and and you're absolutely right. Progressive Press and Truth Dig, as uh, Truth Out, rather. I'm sorry. Um, in you know, in more conventional senses, we may be competitors, but uh, but so so you're so you're made hopeful by this by the uh, the, the the spread of information technology and the, and the democratization of communication. It gives me great hope. Uh, it, of course, there's also the there's always that lurking possibility that it will be taken over by a fascist state, uh, but we mustn't let that happen. And it, it hasn't happened yet, uh, as far as we know. You know, there's, there's that uh, that attempt that the the, the the you know the the terrible uh, treatment of Bradley Manning, uh, the you know, the attempt to discredit WikiLeaks. And you know, we were talking earlier before we were on camera here about uh, Birgitta Birge in, in, in Iceland and about WikiLeaks. And, and you know, there's, there's that attempt to shut that down, but we need to fight that because that is freedom of the press. And I'm, I'm very proud to be part of that and happy that it is going on. And, and it's very important that we maintain freedom of the press. Excellent. Well, um before we uh, finish up, do you uh, are there any uh, do you have any more bo uh, any books in the works, any films? Has hit as uh, Confessions been perhaps optioned by a production studio yet? Professions, uh, Confessions has been bought by uh, Rhino Films and a uh, partnership of Rhino Films and others. And Rhino Films is the company that just made the movie The Sessions. Mm -hmm. Which is up for an Academy Award, uh, and uh, early and did movies like uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with Johnny Depp. It's a very good company, and I, 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 I the producers an amazingly uh, conscientious and uh, um, ethical guy who's very, very strongly in favor of sustainability and the very things we've talked about. So I'm, I'm excited about that. They, 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 they told me that they're going to begin filming this summer or fall. We'll see, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood. You never know what's going on in Hollywood. But yes, that's, that's to come. And um, I'm always writing. That's my job. But, you know, I think like a musician has to practice his, uh, for probably a thousand hours for every hour that the musician is, you know, in a concert. Mm -hmm. A professional athlete has to practice for a thousand hours for every hour that he or she actually performs in the field. And a writer has to do the same thing. So you know, a lot of the writing I do, I don't try to publish. It's just writing, you know. But we have to keep going because that's what it takes. But I'm, I'm always writing. And, yes, I am working on a couple of books right now. Write a now. million words and throw them away. So any, uh, in, in just, just in dream casting, uh, do, you, would you, do you have an actor in mind to play yourself? I think you'd do a great job, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I leave that to the yeah, producers. Well. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, an honor speaking with you, sir. And um, we definitely appreciate you uh, participating in this interview. And uh, we look forward to hopefully speaking with you sometime again. My pleasure, Nicholas. Keep up your good work, you know, and, and keep sending the message out there. People need to have hope, need to follow their passion, and have a good time doing it. That's part of it. You know, this is an amazing, challenging time. 
but it's also a time to feel ecstatic about what we're doing because it can be nothing more blessed and more ecstatic than working to change the world and make it a better place. Things to look forward to, things to be excited about. Well, right. This has been uh, Nicholas Garoff with the Progressive Press speaking to John Perkins. You can see the full article write up as well as a uh, as well as an audio or video transcript on the progressivepress.net. Ms. Perkins, once again, thank you for your time. My pleasure, Nicholas. Thank you. Enjoy New the enjoy the end of the New Hampshire winter. Yes, it will be ending soon. We can have a <laughs> Have a good day, Bye. sir. You too.